Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Um, I and my colleagues, Kevin and James, spent uh, about two, two and a half years working on doing some reproduction. And so that's what I'm going to show you, our replication of uh, prior studies, which is what I'm going to show you today. Kevin is right back there with the uh, long braid. And so our, our domain of research is open source software. Um, this is an interdisciplinary research community. I assume everyone in this room knows what open source software is. OK, good. Um, so the typical. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the typical research topics in this area, um, they really range. Some of them are far more technical in the software engineering world, and some are far more social. And we're looking much more at the social aspects like uh, communication patterns, um, coordination, collaboration, things like that. Um, so the project we were working on was NSF-funded effort as a kind of proof of concept uh, for e-science approaches to a little science domain. And um, the goals are basically to use some existing shared data sets, which for social scientists are absolutely enormous, and for most of the people in this room are not really so big. Um, we worked to develop our workflows collaboratively. That was another key point. And we wanted to build a library of reusable components. That was definitely an explicit goal. Um, so we started off by selecting a few papers uh, for reproduction based on the uh, availability of data and the suitability of the analytical approach because uh, quite a lot of social science research is not suited toward, to this sort of automated um, uh, type of analysis. So the studies that we chose to um, replicate included one that looked at scale-free uh, growth dynamics in open source projects with developers. Um, some of our own work that looked at dynamics of uh, communication patterns using some social network analysis, and a project that, or a paper that did some classification of open source projects um, based on their stage of development and a few other factors to um, identify whether or not they were successes or tragedies. Um, the kind of data that we have to work with um, for open source research is really quite diverse. Um, it goes from the purely qualitative data um, to a far more uh, structured and uh, system-like data, which is much more what we're using is digital trace data. This is a byproduct of the work of the open source uh, developers. It is not intended for research. So while it's relatively easy to get as far as uh, data goes, it's not necessarily very easy to use for research purposes. Um, the data that we use comes from repositories, the hosting forges with which you're probably all familiar, like SourceForge, CodePlex, um, unfortunately is not part of our collection at the time, but FreshMeat, RubyForge, etc. And the data from these repositories are pulled out and um, placed into repositories of repositories so that we you know, don't get a whole campus banned from SourceForge by you know, <coughs> impolitely spidering, for example. Uh, so I'm just going to speak quickly as to two of these repositories that we used um, for this work. The first is the one that we uh, created uh, with our collaborators at Elon University. Um, we have public access to over 300 gigs of data about um, quite a few projects uh, from eight repo repositories now. Um, we very politely scrape it, and then it's parsed, which is un un not fun work, and I, I don't envy the person who manages that end of things. Um, it's released in flat files in SQL data marts, originally on <laughs> SourceForge, but now on Google Code. And we also have a five, terab five terabyte allotment on the um, TerraGrid at uh, San Diego. So this lets others use uh, direct database access. And to date, the requests for access have primarily been from master's students doing uh, theses. Um, but there's, there's a fair mix of the people who are uh, interested in using this data set. Um, the other main repository that we pulled on for this work was the SourceForge Research Data Archive. Um, this is managed by a single PI at Notre Dame who receives an enormous dump from SourceForge directly every month. It is uh, just as produced, and that means it is very, very difficult to use. Um, the delivery methods for us to access it are not particularly easy, um, but it is uh, definitely an asset. So working with this kind of data, our requirements for analysis tools um, 
required scalability because we wanted to take our analyses that might go on you know, a dozen projects up to thousands of projects. Now this isn't big scale for a lot of people, but for social scientists this is enormous. It is world changing scale. Um, we needed to do data meshing from these multiple repositories. Um, and we wanted to do this uh, collaboratively. In part, we had to do it collaboratively because our um, contributors had a fairly diverse skill set and that is, in some cases, even non-overlapping. Um, so just for a snapshot of what that means, the first person I would call data wrangler, expert with data sources, good at coding, great technical skills. Second person, be an analyst, competent with R, no other coding skills, good at debugging, that's me. Um, the third collaborator is a PI, and we all know what PIs do. Um, so we, we chose to use Taverna. Um, there were a number of reasons to go with Taverna. I think the most compelling reasons were flexibility and um, the really responsive MyGrid team and the supportive community. Um, from studying open source, uh, we know that that's one of those signals of health to look for, is that there's a lively community and that the people contributing to the project are um, supporting users even when they ask stupid questions. So our work process was pretty basic for this. We started off by evaluating the data, the methods, um, the analysis, the findings, and then we moved from that to um, developing an abstract workflow together, um, focusing on functionality. Now I say abstract workflow because in the older version of Taverna there were abstract processors that didn't necessarily do anything, they were just placeholders. I don't think those exist in T2. Um, but you can pretty much use other components the same way for planning purposes. So once we had figured out what ha needed to happen overall in this workflow, then we basically cut it in half right along the data to analysis divide. Um, we specifically specified names and forms of the inputs and outputs at that boundary so that when we went to bring them together, there weren't going to be any clashes. And that was critical to making this work seamlessly when we came to um, integrating them. So we independently um, developed our pieces, we tested them. I had to use dummy inputs because I was doing the analysis end. Um, but when it came to actually integrating these partial workflows, it took 15 minutes and 10 minutes of that was figuring out how nested workflows you know, worked. So that was just hands down amazing success in, in my book. That was so easy, I couldn't believe it. And then finally, test the whole thing and give it a run. So <clears throat> one example of the work that we uh, replicated here <coughs> excuse me, was identifying success and tragedy of the Floss Commons. And this was the classification project that uh, our study that looked at 110,000 projects to look at stage of growth according to a number of different um, metrics. <coughs> and we um, not only replicated the analysis but then extended it in a couple of ways. The ways we did that were parameterizing all of the thresholds so the, the um, criteria for this classification involved threshold levels. They've had at least three releases. It's been at least six months since you know this or that. Right? So we parameterized all of those instead of using the hard thresholds that were in the paper. So we could switch them up when we wanted. Um, we also tested some, some additional <coughs> variations on criterion tests. So not just changing what the constants were, but wholly changing the approach to that particular criterion. And this is what we came up with. This is not pretty but it is beautifully functional. So this section up here, all of this in this big light aqua box, I don't know if that color comes through for you, this is all data retrieval and data handling, all of it. The analysis is all right down here. So basically what happens after the data got pulled out, it went into some of these criterion tests, which fed into a classifier. The classifier used a classic truth table to go through and um, verify whether or not the project fit the requirements for classification. And an interesting aspect of implementing it this way is that the truth table actually uh, revealed to us that the original author either did not report or did not consider some of the potential cases, um, which were due to like negative uh, cases, for example. So the key strategies that made this work for us <coughs> is that we really worked to make this transparent and to keep mo uh, all of the pieces that we were building modular because we did a lot of um, bean shell and R shell components that would um, allow the flexible custom processing we needed. Um, metadata and code comments are critical. Now we all know you need code comments for good software, you need them for good research as well. Um, and then we also specifically designed these pieces for reuse, um, particularly the data handling pieces and the quote unquote shims. 
which do all these small transformations. Um, for example, the switch between epoch date format to um, SQL date format, format and then back again um, had to be done in one of the analyses that I've run because I could only get the dates from one data source in one format. I had to change it to epoch in order to do mathematics on it and then change it back to SQL so that I could then query with it. So a little bit roundabout, but having those pieces built once, they can be used many times. We also um, assign the right tasks to the right people. Um, the person who can only uh, code in R should not be doing data handling, for example. Um, and I would note that since then I have learned some Java. Um, some important details about how we made this work. In addition, we're using Subversion for version man management. Anytime you've got collaborators working on something like this, you need to do some, some version management. And if, if we were starting this today, there's no way I would use Subversion. Um, my experiment can handle this much, much better. At the time that we were doing this, um, the sharing permissions and privacy permissions <laughs> weren't in a state where we could put unfinished work and share it among collaborators. Um, very shortly after we basically got the stuff running, they implemented it in what I would consider the perfect way for the way I would want to use it. So I, you know, hats off to the My Experiment team. That was just lovely. Um, uh, we set up server caching because we were testing and testing and testing and testing, and every single time we had to go fetch the data and fetch the data, and that took forever. So that little piece of work made a big difference for actually doing the work. Um, and then there was a big piece of work that made a big difference, and that was creating an OWL ontology to map between the two repository data sources. Um, this is really non-trivial, and had it been solely for this project, I don't know that it could have gotten done. However, it was also um, part of James's dissertation work, so there was further imperative for that to happen. Um, and in order to extend the analyses, we not only implemented some of the author's suggestions for future work, which is very interesting because it immediately showed us in about 10 minutes that what they hypothesized doing as an alternate totally changed the results of the classification. Everything that was one, one form became indefinite. So we also implemented our own variations um, using some different um, methods of examining those criteria. And I found it really remarkably easy to add and modify these pieces. Once we built the rest of the structure, it was just swap this piece out for that one or add another one here. So that was, that was really great. We were able to run analyses on much larger data sets than the original author uh, studies did, and that's partly passage of time. So a paper that was um, produced in 2004 didn't have the data through 2007. Um, in terms of reuse, this was a major goal for us, and I think probably the most successful for our own work. Um, we specifically designed for reuse. Anything that was for sampling or data handling had no constants, only parameters. I broke that rule once and paid for it um, because I found after presenting the paper at a, work, at a conference that uh, we'd forgotten to change one of these date-based parameters from you know, 14 days to X days. So I was much upset with myself for having missed it that one time, but it shows you how important that had become as a part of the way we were doing this. Um, we spent a lot of effort on the data handling, um, but it really paid off because all of those components that we, that we built and all the sub-workflows that look real messy in that prior workflow we just drop them into another one now. Um, that, that really makes a huge difference in terms of the time to results for any subsequent um, data analysis we want to do from these data sources. Um, and it moves the challenge from dealing with data to research, which is where I think it ought to be. Um, there are a few challenges with work, using the workflows. Um, initially, software usability uh, was a real bugbear. Some of the bugs just really wreaked havoc with what we were trying to do. Um, I have to give great credit to the MyGrid team. The usability is constantly improving. Um, T2 is miles ahead of T1. And um, you know, I, I've been really thrilled with the direction of that. And in fact, they, they brought me to Manchester for a couple of weeks over the summer so I could tell them exactly what was uh, going wrong with some of the usability. So they're really open to um, that feedback. And that was wonderful. Um, data handling, no matter how challenging we expected it to be, it was always harder. So that's, that's a caveat with the data <laughs> handling. This is a case where building once to retrieve data from a data source is uh, fabulously useful. So you sink in you know, 40 hours for one repository, but then you, know, you save yourself 40 hours every other time that you go and, and do the same kind of data source. So um, we also had no existing web services or appropriate examples to emulate. Um, for us, web services weren't a very feasible option. We didn't have the infrastructure or resources to support them. Very limited potential user market. 
So it's kind of, you know, negotiable whether or not that would actually be worth the time and effort for us. And when it came to looking for examples, pretty much all the examples are bioscience oriented or so general that it didn't really, you know, help me figure out what I needed to do. Um, there were no real social science examples, but there are now. Um, some of the barriers to uptake that we encountered when bringing this to the open source software research community are what I would call little science issues. And that's um, pi paradigmatic clash. Um, various researchers have different epistemologies, different methods, different theories that they want to te test. The lack of agreement overall is um, what really holds up this kind of adoption of this kind of a tool. There's also a lack of incentives to collaborate. There's no funding imperative. Um, it's not a huge community with set standards on how we do our work. So um, some of the structures that apply in, say, biology or chemistry in terms of, you know, this is the way the lab is organized, this is the way the rewards are set, not so much in open source. Um, I also would consider there to be a bimodal distribution of the requisite skills to make this work. Many social scientists cannot code. And anything um, to do with R, to do with Java, scares the pants off of them. Um, and then on the other end of the scale, many of the people who are doing uh, research into open source software are software engineers, and they don't see any point in using the same tools as anyone else, and will happily tell me that I should use Python as well, which becomes very insulting by the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, twentieth time you've heard it. Um, but overall, I found that students are far more willing to experiment with these tools and approaches. Um, sitting down with a couple of uh, students at doctoral consortia uh, over the summer, I think I, you know, got some believers out of that, and and so. You know, they're looking at using it for their own dissertation work, which is great. Um, and just to show you that it was not all for naught, um, we've continued using the tool for our own work and repurposing some of those elements that we built. So this is just a quick example of some research, re recent research that we did, which is an um, estimation of the user base and potential user interest, the size of these um, uh, populations based on common release and download patterns that we observed in community-style open source projects. Um, Downloads uh, in particular are a proxy for user interest and uh, common uh, for pro project success because people assume if they downloaded it then people are interested, that's successful. Um, but for a number of reasons, downloads are a very, very poor metric. And um, so we wanted to look for something just even a little bit better. So what we have here is you know, our, our theoretical model of what we think is happening with the downloads. So there's some base rate of experimentation, um, but when a release happens, the active users update, and so all of this area under the curve is the size of your active user base. And we don't have very good ways to verify this, but this was the working hypothesis. So, and this is, and this is why we thought this would work really well. So a quote unquote normal download release pattern for BibDesk, which is a reference management software, um, shows that every single time you have one of these kind of pink red verticals, which is a uh, release of the software, you have a spike in downloads at the same time. And there's a little sawtooth pattern here, day of the week. Um, this is absolutely typical for any kind of uh, web-based web user behavior. And <clears throat> also notable in this particular version, and I don't know how well you can see it from the back of the room, is that I think there's only one spike that's a notable spike on this uh, whole thing that is not associated with a release. It's right here. So we suspect it was you know project of the month or something like that. Um, so while I was at Manchester, just for comparison, um, once I had fixed this particular workflow and gotten that constant out of there, um, I ran it on Taverna. Taverna's download and release patterns show external effects. Um, so yes, you get the spike with a release, but you also get spikes for no apparent reason. I sat down with uh, some of the folks and, and dug through some records and said, what's going on with these dates? And we could easily identify that, you know, at this point, there was a release candidate that went out, and there were two presentations, and you know that's probably why this is offset just a little bit, was the presentations weren't quite on the same time. You know, 1.5 right there with a huge spike in downloads. So that's the kind of thing you expect to see. What you don't expect to see, though, is you know all of these random ones that we just couldn't explain, and we dug around quite a bit. No way to figure it out. So what we take away from this is Taverna is not normal uh, in, in the community. Um, developed open source sense. Um, and that all of the, the work that the team does in terms of speaking tours, publications, tutorials, other events, those are influencing <laughs> adoption directly. So um, 
that didn't get necessarily at what we were looking for initially, but what it, also, what it does also tell us is that we can use this particular workflow and run it on projects and identify the ones that are typical community development patterns and the ones where something else is going on, like Taverna. So we also have a poster on um, e-science approaches for open source software researchers. If you care to stop by and have a look at any point. Um, papers, presentations, even a uh, tutorial video on how we did this with Taverna are available from our website. And the My Experiment group there is for open source software researchers. So if you'd like a look at some of the stuff we developed and the other people who are interested, um, that's where to go and find it. So any questions? Well, the main constraint that we face is that we're using the data that we can get from repositories. This is not insider data. We don't have um, anything to corroborate except what we can get. So from a business perspective, you know, one would use web logs and things like that um, to, to validate some of these things. But um, in the open source world, we've got what, you know, what's in the re repository. So people look at things like you know, time between releases, um, how recently the last release was made, how regular releases are, um, how long it's been going, how many contributors, how many downloads, um, and not just cumulative downloads, but you know, rate of downloads over time, whether it's increasing or decreasing. My general sense is that it's really hard to tell much, especially when you're throwing a wad of spaghetti at the wall, basically, because there are so many different indicators that they're testing and trying out that it's really hard to identify whether any one of them was really contributing um, overall in terms of evaluation. But um, a hypothesis that came out of some other data analysis that I thought show here that we're trying to follow up on is um, the usage of inclusive pronouns by non-core members of the community. So in other words, if, if your core members say, our project, you should do this, that's expected. But if your non-core members also say, our project, what are we going to do, as opposed to saying, success factors such as downloads or multiple releases or things like that? I have to say I can't recall because it's been a, quite a while since I looked at the raw data from that particular bit of um, work. Um, I would say in general, um, actually sometimes the, they're often with sampling on these projects, there's thresholds as a minimum of say seven developers because once you get to seven developers, it's non-trivial coordination. Why seven? I don't know, which is part of the reason we did it this way. So we could say maybe three is where it gets to be non-trivial coordination. Um, so I, I can't directly answer that one. <coughs> However, I can probably dig out uh, a nice big flat file of data for you if you really want. <laughs>
Well, thank you all.